Hi, this is Rich Powell from ClearPath. At ClearPath, we're very focused on finding ways to scale up grid-level energy storage, which we think is essential for a conservative clean energy future. Now, why is that? Well, just very quickly, most folks know that power demand is low in the mornings, it gets a lot higher in the afternoons, and it goes back down in the evenings. And so power generation needs to follow that energy load. Low in the morning, high in the afternoon, low in the evening. So for some major clean energy resources, that's actually a challenge. Nuclear plants, for example, run best when they run flat out all the time. They don't follow the load, they're just flat base load generators. Wind and solar, on the other hand, are highly intermittent resources. So they go up and down rapidly as the wind potential and the solar potential go up and down that they collect. Both of these resources would need very large energy storage to capture energy at times of high availability and then redeploy it at times of high demand. And so we need to find major energy storage technologies that would meet that need. So the thing folks are probably most familiar with are batteries, and that's a form of storage using chemical energy. The most common version of this, which is in all of our watches and cell phones, are lithium ion batteries. And these can be strung together to form very large grid scale storage. At least to date, this approach is still pretty expensive and the longevity of those batteries is at least now unknown. And so people have been experimenting with other forms of chemical storage. Most of this takes the form of what are called flow batteries that use very large tanks of chemicals and exchanges the energy back and forth. Some folks have focused on very high-end chemicals like vanadium. There's actually a vanadium flow battery company called UET that's already been spun out of the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Others are focused on much more commodity chemicals like sodium and sulfur that would be very low cost to deploy. And lastly, folks, particularly up at Harvard, have been looking at organic chemicals, things effectively like sugars that could store a lot of energy uh, as well. So that's the chemical route. Now another major route already in place is the gravity route. And so that's uh, things like pumped hydropower. This is where you have two different lakes and when there's extra electricity, water is pumped up a hill and then allowed to flow back down through some turbines when we need electricity later on. There's a huge one of those, as big as three nuclear power plants currently in Virginia. Other folks working on gravity are trying to use weights like rocks. There's one company uh, that essentially has developed a rock train, which pushes these rocks up a hill on a train using electric motors, and then using the same technology as regenerative braking in a hybrid vehicle, harvests that energy when you come back downhill as it slows the train down. There are two other major routes. One of these is pressure, and this would be using either compressed liquid like water or compressed air in large tanks or underground caverns, and then releasing that when you need to generate electricity. And the last is using heat. There's a team at MIT using a very old technology called fire bricks that would store huge amounts of heat basically in stone underground and then re-harvest that later either as heat or use that heat to create electricity down the road. All of these technologies still have a ways to go before we hit the sort of cost and performance thresholds that we'll need to really scale them up globally. And so we think continued federal support for research in energy storage is vital for a conservative clean energy future. Thanks very much for listening.